Welcome to Electron Line. In this video, we're going to explore the concept of the Compton wavelength. That is this portion of the equation, the Compton effect equation. Notice that this is what we call the Compton wavelength and realizing that what's in the parentheses here can take on a value from zero to two depending upon the value of the scattering angle. For a scattering angle of zero, zero degrees, then this becomes zero and the difference in wavelength is zero and for a scattering angle of 180 degrees, this becomes two, and then the difference in the wavelength will be twice this quantity right here we now know as the Compton wavelength. Also notice that in the denominator of this quantity right here is the mass of the particle from which the photon scatters. And so you can see that since it's in the denominator for a large mass, this ratio will be very small and the difference will be very small. The size of the difference of the wavelength between the incoming photon and the scattering photon, the difference in the wavelength does definitely depend upon the size of the particle off of which it scatters. The larger the particle, the smaller the difference, the smaller the particle, the larger the difference. And then you have to keep in mind that the photon, we typically are talking about a UV photon, an X-ray photon, or a gamma ray photon, and if the wavelengths of the photons are too large, a very tiny change may not be noticeable or measurable on those wavelengths. So typically, we are dealing with some fairly high energy photons, typically X-ray photons, because they have small enough wavelengths so that a very small change of the wavelength can be measured and detected. And we'll see some examples of that in a later video. Now let's calculate for an electron what this quantity would be equal to. For an electron, we can say that H divided by m sub naught c is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds divided by the mass of an electron, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And then we'll do this again for the mass of, with the mass of a proton and see how different the change in the wavelength will be and then multiply times 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which is close enough to the speed of light. So let's see with a calculator what that is equal to. Okay, 6.626 e to the 34 minus, divided by 9.11 e to the 31 minus, and divided by 3 e to the 8 equals, and notice we're dealing with a change in the wavelength of 2.42, times 10 to the minus 12, and that will be in meters. Now notice compared to the wavelength of UV radiation, which varies anywhere from about 400 times 10 to the minus 9 to 1 times 10 to the minus 9, you would have a very hard time measuring this small of a change relative to a UV photon. But for an X-ray photon, which can be as small as 1 times 10 to the minus 12, you can see that this is in the ballpark of the size of a high-energy X-ray photon. And so with X-rays, you can indeed measure the change in the wavelength if they're scattered off of electrons. Now let's calculate this number using a proton. So for a proton, and I'll write a P plus for proton, we get H over MC, or M sub naught C, is equal to 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds divided by 9.11 times 10 to the minus. Ooh, no, that's, that's electron. We're now dealing with a proton, which is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. They're much heavier than electrons, and 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second is a good approximation for the speed of light. So 6.626 e34 minus, divide by 1.67 e to the 27 minus, and divide by 3 e to the 8 equals, and notice here the change in the wavelength would be as small as 1.32 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. And so that is such a small change that even with very high energy X-rays, which we're now getting into the realm of gamma rays, you would be very hard pressed to measure that very tiny difference. Therefore, the Compton scattering effect is typically seen when photons, typically X-ray photons, scatter off of electrons rather than off the nuclei of atoms.
You may also wonder how do these units end up being meters? So let's explore that for a moment. So the units of joules times seconds divided by kilograms times meters per second, how does that end up being meters? Well, first of all, we can take this seconds and move to the numerator, and joules is newton times meters. So this can be written as a newton meter, second squared by taking this one over seconds to the numerator, then we have kilograms divided by meters, and right away we can see that these meters will cancel out those meters. Now a newton is a force, the units of force, which is a kilograms meters per second squared, so we can replace that one by kilograms meters per second squared. That's for newtons. Now we have second squared in the numerator and kilograms in the denominator. And then if we cancel these out and that, we notice we end up indeed with meters, which is the units for wavelength. You can see when we multiply all this out, we do indeed get units for wavelength. But in summary, yes, we can say that this here can be considered what we call the Compton wavelength, which is very close to the average typical difference in the wavelength of an incoming photon relative to an exiting photon from this collision. Notice it will be anywhere from zero to two times that quantity. And for, uh, let's say, scattering angles of 90 degrees, that value would be equal to this for the scattering off an electron and this for scattering off of a proton. And that's what we mean by the Compton wavelength.